Good morning. Thanks for joining us as we continue our series in the book of Genesis, In the Beginning, Jesus. As we uncover, unpack, and proclaim that God the Son is throughout not only the New Testament, but foreshadowed and implied in the Old Testament as well, as far back as the beginning. Quick disclaimer, I had two cups of coffee, so I apologize in advance. Today we're going to study chapter 14 of Genesis that Mike just read flawlessly, in my opinion, at least compared to how I'm going to read it. And this doesn't read as easily as the other passages that we've, we've covered, especially over the past two weeks. But there in this passage that Mike read, there are some specifics, like which king was over what region and specific cities and areas that, where there were battlefields or the context in which some people came from. Years ago, uh, I, the first time I ever baptized someone, uh, there was a young man who had committed to Jesus, and he asked me to baptize him, and I was pretty nervous. I hadn't really spoken in front of anyone other than maybe sharing my testimony at the church. And so also on top of baptizing him, I had to make sure that everything was ready from the water being warm in the baptistry to making sure we had towels and even brought bathing suits. Awkward. So then we got into the water. And by the way, he was a big boy, much larger than me. But for whatever reason, I was baptizing him by myself. I don't make that mistake anymore. And as I began to introduce him, I read this passage in Matthew. It says in Matthew 3, starting in verse 13, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. Well, I didn't say deter. I was nervous, and for whatever reason, when I read it, here's how I read it. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, but John tried to deter him. And for the longest time, I was teased for saying that. I, I'm no longer at that church. No, that's not the reason. And my wife, when she was just my friend, she would always make fun of me when this passage, Dieter, she would always say that to me. But I say all of that to give you a quick disclaimer. I'm probably going to do similar things with the names that were just read. And if you want to tease me, I can take it. But I have a microphone, just so you know. But what I don't want you to miss is themes and the foreshadowing of the gospel that this passage that we're going to read actually has. Passages like this can be read through and not retained because we're caught up in the pronunciation of names. But what I don't want us to miss is that in this story, while possibly seeming random and not easily quotable, is just as biblical and God-breathed as for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that anyone who would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And even on top of this passage we're studying today of how God breathed it is, it's also specific because get ready for this, it actually happened. And it's not written like fiction. It's written with ways for historians to look up and look back to verify the facts and to actually confirm that what the Bible teaches isn't some figment of someone's imagination, but historical, theological, and spiritual. Because the facts of war and relationships took place, and they're recorded in this passage. So let's begin with the first 12 verses of Genesis, chapter 14, which we are going to sludge through, and then I'll do a bit of a recap. I'm mostly doing this for all of your benefit to hear me go through these names. Here we go. Verse 1. Pray for me. At the time when Ampharel was king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elessar, Kedlomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim. These kings went to war against Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, I know that word, Shinab, king of Adam, Shemabur, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these latter kings joined forces in the valley of Siddim, that is the Dead Sea Valley. For 12 years, they had been subject to Kedlomer, but in the 13th year, don't laugh, they rebelled. In the 14th year, Kedlomer and the kings allied with him went out and defeated the Rephites in Asheroth, Carnaim, the Zuditites in Ham, the Ammonites in Shaviv, Karafim. If you laugh, I'm going to invite you to read it. And the Horatites in the hill of the country of Seir. 
as far as El Paran near the desert. Then they turned back and went to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh. And they conquered the whole territory of the Amicalites, as well as the Amorites who were living in Hezazon Tamar. Wow, almost done. The king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adam, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Sidium against Kedalamur, king of Elam, title king of Goyim, Amaphrel, king of Shinar, and Ariak, king of Elisar. If you're pregnant, here are some great names. <laughs> Four kings against five. Verse 10, now the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of the men fell into them, and the rest fled to the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. Then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. You're welcome. Yes. <sighs> One thing you may notice in this passage is that there's a bunch of sermons there's a bunch of sermons in what I've already read, and today I'm going to teach a little bit differently. We read some, I'm going to explain it a little, we're going to read a little bit more, and the sermon's really going to be at the end, just so you know. But what we just read, there are themes, there are, is historical evidence that could be unpacked and uncovered in this entire chapter. And once I started to dig into it, I was very surprised, I was very blessed by how much in this chapter of names I couldn't pronounce actually point me to Christ which is a far cry from about a week and a half ago when I began to read it as a student rather than as just something that had happened to get through. Because when I first read it, I had no inspiration. I had no idea what would be preached today. And I'm grateful for Malik and I'm grateful for Mike because they helped me see the goodness in this passage. So let's recap. You have a foreign confederation of four kings with their armies that align and defeat a group of five Canaanite kings and their armies. While defeating the Canaanite armies, these four kings take captive Abram's nephew Lot, who we read a lot about, pun intended, last week, as he was a prisoner of war from Sodom, plus the other army's goods, their food, and their possessions. And now we will see this news get back to Abram regarding his nephew who had been captured. Verse 13 is a lot easier. A man who had escaped and came and reported this to Abram the Hebrew, it says. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Anir, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Dan is a place, it's not Dan, like over, he's over there. Now this man reports this information about Lot to Abram, and it calls him Abram the Hebrew, a designation that in some contexts were considered either an example of Abram's ethnicity or even a bit of showing the social class in which Abram found himself in. The reason this is important is it's the first time anyone has been designated as a Hebrew in the scriptures. And what does Abram the Hebrew do? He enlists 318 trained men from his household, and I thought I had a big family. What type of vehicle do you buy to drive 318 people to Red Robin? <laughs> now, household does not imply under his roof as much as some shared bloodline. And what type of men did he enlist? It says trained men, which means trained and or experienced men in military. And they began to go after this group of armies that have taken Abram's nephew captive text doesn't say anything about how Lot feels, doesn't say anything about what Lot's doing, says nothing about this. And two weeks ago, when we studied the passage of Abram regarding his lie about his wife being his sister, and what was our application, husbands? Don't do that. He had this self-preservation, and it was in direct contrast that is talked about throughout the New Testament, especially in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, exalting the great faith of Abram, and it was accredited to him righteousness prior to Jesus coming to live a perfect life, die a sacrificial death, and physically and victoriously rise again. But today we see a bit more of Abram, the general, the warrior, the Chuck Norris, if you will. The one that it didn't seem was going to be phased by size or power of other armies, but was going to be shrewd in the way that he came against these armies to rescue his family by any means necessary. 
Verse 15. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and the text says he routed them. What? Pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. Abram divided the men. He was strategic, strategery. Does anyone know that reference? Praise God. He was strategic in the way that he would rescue Lot. And Moses writes, who was writing Genesis, writes, he routed them. He and 318 men dominated them through strategy and intimidation, through mental strength, and most importantly, God being with them. And this rescue that takes place gets about one verse, but it was so significant. Verse 17, after Abram returned from defeating Kedilomer, that's the one I'm the worst at, and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, then Melchizedek, I got that one, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of the God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hands. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. We have an interesting turn of events here partly because of what happens and also partly because of how it's written. Abram and his militia take out these opposing armies who have captured his nephew. And then it says the king of Sodom comes out to meet him, but it doesn't give us anything about that conversation yet, but turns right to the meeting between Abram and Melchizedek. So what do we know about King Melchizedek? Well, not much. He's the king of Salem, which, you know, eventually becomes the land that we know as Jerusalem, spoiler. And yet this mystery person is discussed here in the Psalms. He's, he's discussed in Genesis, he's discussed in Psalms, then eventually he's discussed in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. And here's what it says in the Psalms. David writes, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And then in Hebrews chapter 5, 8 through 10 the writer of Hebrews, speaking of Jesus, just like I believe David was, he writes, son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be the high priest in order of Melchizedek. And then jumping to chapter seven of Hebrews, it points back to what we're studying today. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and he blessed him and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, this isn't me talking about this. This is what the text says. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the son of God, he remains a priest forever. So Melchizedek, The king of righteousness, without mention of his genealogy, where he came from, he's not knowable in many ways that we're used to knowing about people in Scripture. And yet he was a foreshadowing. He was a foretaste of our king of righteousness, who is Jesus, who gifted us his righteousness, and he rules and reigns high over everything in the kingdom of God. And the king of Salem and Abram share in what can be seen as, doesn't it kind of sound like communion? But in this time period, it was seen, this wine and bread was seen as a luxurious meal to partake in as a symbol of God's blessing and his grace. But Moses, who's writing this, also points out that after this communion with one another, in this luxurious meal, that Abram gave a tenth of everything that he had as a symbol of his reliance and his dependence upon God. Now, we'll see in a moment what he was offered from the king of Sodom. But Abram shows his reliance. He shows his allegiance and true need for God above any earthly riches or possessions. This is a reason that we do offering in this church. And also, why, don't, why I, at least, never call it a tithe, which means a tenth. It means 10%. Because we don't want to expect or assume that what your offering is going to be is going to be 
because we want you to personally trust God with your offering and what you give back to him, which may in some cases be 10% of what you earn. Sometimes it might be less than that because you're, you're still wrestling with God, you're still getting to know him, and you're still learning how to trust him. And in some cases, what we offer him is more than 10%. So we don't call it a tithe. But what is most important is that you see that this offering, this tithe that Abram gives to the king Melchizedek for God is worship rather than a tip or expecting something from God when he gives it. Money is very weird in the Bay Area, isn't it? Like, it's super weird. And with inflation higher than it's ever been, with gas prices skyrocketing since February and interest rates accelerating over the past few months, giving to God may become something we put off or are afraid of. And I totally get that. But as a forgiven child of God, like many of you, I want to remind you that giving of an offering is not a requirement or an admission fee. It is an opportunity to worship God. And, see, and for you also to see that this life is not all that we look forward to or expect. After this time of foreshadowing of communion and Abram giving of his offering, Moses, the writer, lets us in on what transpires between Abram and the king of Sodom. Here we go. Verse 21. The king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, with raised hand, I have sworn an oath to the Lord God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abraham rich. You know, I'm not like this. I'd be like, bring it. <laughs> but this is Abram's conviction. The king of Sodom comes to Abram with a grateful posture to thank him for doing what he and the other armies could not do. And yet Abram, under the protection and might of God, did not want or need any material reward from the king of Sodom. Nor would he want, it, want to be associated with Sodom, but instead tells the king that he has made an oath to God and who is truly his king and protector, as we saw as Moses was writing this passage, to show that Abram meeting with the king of Salem who was Melchizedek, and worshiping alongside him, partaking in communion and giving of his tithe, made known to us as the readers where Abram's loyalties truly lied. Now, God had promised Abram that he would be the leader of a great nation, and Abram knew that he didn't need to align with a corrupt king and nation for that promise to be fulfilled. Abram, like all of us, should be paying attention to what we say and do that could be seen as taking away glory from God. Okay, now we're going to start preaching, so buckle up. Are there ways that we are taking credit from God and keeping it for ourselves? I'm going to pass around the microphone. No, I'm just kidding. The way we speak where possibly we are full of pride, where we want to bring glory and honor and kudos to ourselves rather than God is a real problem, not just in the world today. The world doesn't know any better, but in the Christian church. When you describe a situation or circumstance that maybe you have endured or maybe you've acted less stupid than maybe you once did, perhaps. You could give credit where credit is due, which is to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who is in the business of transforming his people. He's in the business of spiritual growth. He's in the business of Christ likeness. He's in the business of sanctification. And here's the problem with even mentioning this to you, church is when we as human beings hear something like this, we tend to want to justify ourselves and we have a really hard time giving credit to anyone but ourselves. Or we treat giving God credit like a work that then justifies us. And Abram not only spoke in a way that was to give God credit, at least in this circumstance, but he wanted to live and act in such a way as well that meant that people would not misconstru misconstrue who was ultimately responsible for the power and the work that was done that deserved praise. But then Abram says something that is fascinating. 
And it deserves some unpacking because it applies to us today in this very room more than many of us might think. Here's what he said towards the end of his spiel. Verse 24, I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me to Anir, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them have their share. Here's why this is fascinating. Abram wants to receive nothing from the king of Sodom, but he does not apply his conviction to his men that also served and risked their lives to help get Lot back. Abram didn't want to be associated with Sodom at all. But when it came to the men that he fought and served with, he wanted to make sure that they received their due. This brings up a very interesting theme that we see here, and in my opinion, is a precursor to something we will study in the book of Acts when we get back into that letter in the fall. But before I point out this passage, and I'm going to have, we're going to read a lot, I want to make abundantly and unapologetically clear as an adopted son of God's who has been saved by grace through faith in Christ. You ready? That we are not saved by what we do. Two amens. Thank you. We are not saved by what we do. Our works gain us nothing. It is God's love expressed through grace, getting what you do not deserve in Jesus's life, death, and resurrection that give any of us access to God. Eternal life and a future hope in heaven are all because of God, not because of how good we are. So why am I sharing that now? Because there is a huge misnomer in Christianity. It's this. Simply that moral modification as a replacement of grace through faith in Christ. Here's what I mean by that. When we aim for moral modification at best, we get a placebo version of faith that misses the point entirely. When we come to Christ, when we commit our lives, when we bow a knee, our morals can and usually do change. Because our priorities have changed, because our lordship has changed. No longer are we master of our own domain, yet Christ comes and usually slowly and progressively starts to change us over time as the Lord becomes more Lord over all pieces of our lives. But far too often, we replace this with a code of ethics rather than a bowing down of our entire being. So I stress this, Because I think whatever we think justifies us is really our God. Think about that for a second. And if we're coming to Christ and we're still attempting to justify ourselves through our own moral behavior, we really continue to be our own God. What makes you a Christian? Well, I never watch rated R movies. Well, you're missing out, bro. That does not save you. And in this case, we tend to expect others to do what we do as well as we do in the public eye, if not better than we do. And then our moral standard is the expectations we put on others rather than saving grace expressed through trusting Christ as Lord. So you have Abram who has communed and spoken with God personally, who God has given a great promise to, which will become a covenant which we'll study next week. And he has had opportunities in his many, many years of life to both honor and disobey God. How about you guys? Have you had opportunities to honor and disobey God? All right. And here's where I want us to sit for a second. Abram does not expect every other person to do what he does because he has walked where they haven't. He has experienced what they have not His sanctification process looks different than mine and yours. And so he speaks up for these, I'm assuming, younger men and does not expect them to want, need, or do exactly what he decides to do for himself. So if Abram's and yours and my sanctification process all look different, then they require different lessons and circumstances. And if our sanctification process is different, why do we expect everyone to act and react the same? 
I consider this a big deal because this theme is seen not just here, but in the New Testament, in the book of Acts. We haven't gotten there yet. We will in the fall. But in Acts 15, when Gentile believers began to come to Christ, there was this big uproar with the Jewish Christians who wanted to expect the Gentiles, the non-Jews, to keep the same Levitical laws that they had observed. So a bunch of elders and apostles got together to discuss this very thing. So here's what I'm asking you to do. There's a little bit of participation. I'm going to ask you to turn on your Bible app or grab the Bible in front of you or take your paper Bible. And I'm going to ask you to turn to Acts 15. It's on page something. I have no idea. Acts 15. So open, scroll, Acts 15, and we're going to begin in verse 1, and I'm going to ask you to look at it yourself because I don't want you just hearing these words. I want you to see them. Now, they'll be on the screen also, and some of you are like, oh, I'm going to put it away. No, look it up, please. Acts 15. And because I'm already sick of my own voice, I'm going to invite Laura to come up, and Laura is going to read this exact, or the beginning of this passage in Acts 15, starting in verse 1 through 5. Laura, if you would read it for us. It's not on. Sean, we muted. There we go. There we go. (laughs) Acts 15, starting in verse 1. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the Pharisee party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Thank you, Laura. These Jewish Christians expected these new converts who were Gentiles, non-Jews, who had not grown up with the traditions of the Hebrews to keep the traditions of the Hebrews to then be able to come to Christ. But as we attempt to make abundantly clear every single week, we are not saved by what we do, even religious traditions. With that, I want to keep reading, and so I'm going to invite my friend Jenny to come up, and she's going to continue to read the passage, verses 6 through 11. Would you read that for us? The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you, that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and belief. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Thank you, Jenny. Appreciate that. Now, Peter, who Jenny was uh, using the tone of, lays it out. The Gentiles heard from his lips that salvation for both Jew and Gentile, that God does not discriminate but purifies all hearts through faith. And all of salvation for both Jew and Gentile is through grace. Something that they, you, and I could not earn. But we have been given it as a gift through Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. Salvation for Jew and Gentile is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Helena, I'm going to invite you up, and would you read the final part of that passage we're going to study today, please? Chapter 15, 12 through 21. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. 
Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat strangled from animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Thank you, Helena. So we, as followers of Jesus, have a message to bring to the world that, yes, all of us are sinful. We all fail. We all make mistakes. We all sin and commit cosmic treason against a perfect and holy God. But the answer to that is not to try to be a little bit better. But it's Jesus. It's Jesus' life. It's his death. It's his resurrection as payment or, big word, you ready? Atonement for our sins, which is the grace that God has given us to then be received through faith, to trust this grace and be found in Christ, even though we're sinful, even though we make mistakes, even though we commit cosmic treason. I don't want anyone to hear sin and just go, oh, oops. No, we actually commit treason against God. And yet, even after I came to Christ in June 13th, 2001, even as I have started to follow him, I still sin daily. And yet I'm found in Christ, which means I am a forgiven saint. And we don't need to put me on like glass things because I'm a saint. I'm only a saint because of Jesus, not because of anything I've done. I'm found in Christ. And other than by grace through faith in Christ, there is nothing that can make me right with God. And if we truly understand this, if we truly embrace this message, we don't have to attempt to reform people's behaviors or get them to act a certain way in order to look the part. Jesus didn't come for an external makeover. He came to internally take us over. And it's progressive. He starts to change us over time. And that is the rescue that I want us to focus on today. It is not one of minor change. Lot wasn't just, you know, given some stuff while he was taken over by these kings. He wasn't made a little bit more comfortable within the captivity of the opposing kings. Lot was rescued. And in order to be rescued, you first need to stop attempting to save yourself. Ask any lifeguard. And Lot was under the bondage of being overpowered by military, knowing that he could not save himself. And I wonder how often we don't actually believe that we can't save ourselves spiritually. Well, I gave some money. I attended church two weeks out of four. Oh, I serve. Oh, I watched the sermon on, on or I listened to the sermon on podcast. Cool. But none of that justifies you. And do we fall into the trap that perhaps... We can just try harder and be better, and that will make up for our transgressions and sins. Or maybe we are Christians. Maybe we've committed to Jesus. Maybe we understand the gospel, and we say we love Jesus, but we continue to sin so grace may increase. Well, I'll be forgiven. God doesn't just rescue us from the wages of death. Even though he does that, and he ought to be celebrated constantly, and that's what we do here, he rescues us from attempting to earn our salvation or expect others to be a certain way in order then that they can then claim to be a Christian. God's been rescuing me my entire spiritual life. First when I came to him and I first believed, and then over and over and over again in this progressive process known as sanctification. Uh, some of you know this, some of you might not. I was kidnapped as a child. I, I was three and a half. My mom uh, took me from my dad. They were split. They were divorced. My claim to fame, uh, second kid ever on a milk carton. Whoop, whoop. 
And I was eventually found. My mom took me to a place called Franklin, Nebraska. We stayed in a glorified hotel. But I was eventually found. But to be honest, I don't know that I even realized I needed to be rescued. According to the law, I was my father's responsibility, but my mother had taken me, and I didn't know any better. I wasn't running from rescue. I had no idea that rescue was needed. My mom loved me a ton, but she didn't go about it the right way by taking me away from my dad or telling me that my dad had died or changing my name to something else. And much of the world that we're around have no idea that rescue is something that they need. Life seems under control for the moment, or they have found a nice rhythm that doesn't need to be disrupted by religion. Why isn't there traffic on Sunday mornings? Because of this very thing. But rescue isn't about religion and attempting to do all the traditions of religious people. Blah! You can quote me on that. Blah! Being rescued is about a relationship that supersedes any other earthly relationship that will ever be offered. I love my wife, but she's not my savior. All five of my kids are amazing, but they're not my identity. And it means that us and our creator, the God of heavens, of the heavens, sent his son who lived among us perfectly, but his purpose of coming to this earth, born of a virgin, living a sinless life, was to die, to be a sacrifice, to provide rescue for men, women, and children who realized that there was a spiritual deficit and need of rescue and stopped attempting to save themselves by just doing better or pretending to be holy, but bowed a knee to a savior who did for them what they were unwilling and unable to do for themselves, which was save themselves. They couldn't, only Jesus can. This sacrifice and this rescue is illustrated in my mind through this story that perhaps you've heard me tell before, but tough. You're going to hear it again. Laura, you can come on up. When the World Trade Center crumbled to the ground on the dreadful day of September 11th, 2001, more than 3,000 people died. But a few of those who were buried beneath the rubble miraculously survived the toppling of the Twin Towers. Two of these individuals were named Will Jimeno and John McLaughlin. They were a pair of Port Authority employees who responded to the attack and were on the bottom floor when the South Tower began to fall. They raced to an elevator shaft and amazingly survived the 100-story collapse around them, but were buried dozens of feet down in the midst of an array of rubble, trapped without water, breathing smoke-filled air, but Will and John had little hope of survival. Yet as they laid there, pinned under a mountain of debris, something was stirring inside an accountant in Connecticut they had never met. Dave Carnes, who had spent 23 years in active duty in the Marine Corps, was watching the scene play out on television like the rest of us who were alive at this time. But more than allowing it to merely trouble him, he decided to do something about it. He went to his boss and he told him he wouldn't be back for a while. Dave went to a barber shop, asked for a high and tight haircut, but then stopped by his home to put on his military fatigues, hoping that the uniforms would allow him access to the blocked off area surrounding Ground Zero. He drove to Manhattan at speeds at 121 or 120 miles an hour. What, what? and arrived by late, late afternoon. While rescue workers were being called off the wreckage pile because of danger, Dave was able to stay because of the clout and the credential that came with his military uniform. Finding another Marine nearby, the two men walked the pile together, seeking to save the lost. After an hour of searching, they heard the faint sound of tapping pipes and yelling. Will and John had been trapped for nine hours by this time, completely incapable of working themselves free. Yet in the midst of all that rubble, a Marine who earlier in the morning had been working on a spreadsheet in Connecticut found them. Of the 20 people pulled from the heaped up remains of the World Trade Center, Will Jimeno and John McLaughlin were numbers 18 and 19 respectively, all because Dave Carnes took off his suit, put on rescue fatigues, and stepped into the despair and darkness of ground zero. In the same way, 
but to an infinitely greater degree. God took off his royal robe. He stepped into the dark and depraved culture, which is 2022, and he served us. He, we were buried in the depths of our rubble, of our own foolishness, with zero chance of pulling ourselves up out of our own sin. And we were without hope until the Holy One clothed himself in humanity, and he rescued us. And he became sin for us on the cross. And so church, I implore you, if you are attempting to save yourself, stop, bow a knee, trust the king who is knowable and personal and better than any earthly king this world will ever produce. If you are attempting to pay God back for the gift of grace that he has given, it, given you, stop it, repent, and love God through obeying him at his word, because even though the actions might look exactly the same, motivation matters in the kingdom of God. And lastly, if you are a Christian, but you have expectations of other people to morally clean themselves up or are putting expectations on them that the Lord never does, stop, repent, change direction, and trust that God will and can sanctify those he justifies in his timing and good and pleasing will. So the service is almost over, but we're going to respond with one song. And my hope is that this passage, which I first read and was like, what? Spoke to our hearts in a way that only God can through the work of his word, through the power of his spirit, and that we would feel something that's different. That we wouldn't come in contact with God, the spirit and God in his word and miss the point of what he's trying to teach us, which is this, we cannot save ourselves. Only Christ can do that. And that is why we worship him and adore him and love him. And some of us raise hands and some of us keep our hands low and some of us sing at the top of our lungs and some of us lip sync. It doesn't matter. What matters is that God and his goodness is something that we realize is the only thing that can make us right with God. And so would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for a passage that I wasn't planning on preaching. And thank you, I thank you, God, for how it preached to me. Lord, would you use this time of reflection in the song of singing praise to the one who rescues. God, would you use it to bond our hearts to you? And would you be glorified through our lives? And would you get all the glory and honor and credit? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.